All right, let's, we have a lot of verses to read. So John chapter 10, let's begin in verse 22. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep, keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not, of my, not my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a, a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, it is, not, is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him of whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe that the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. Then many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John wrote about this man were true, and many believed in him there. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you that you've already been at work among us, Lord. We're so grateful for that. Lord, I do pray for all those who stand, stood, that you would bless them and strengthen them and encourage them, redirect their focus on you and to trust you, for, for you are so uh, able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think. So we just pray that you would meet them right where they're at, Lord. Thank you for your grace in interrupting our, our normal routine to minister to them individually and then the blessing of us being able to be used by you in their lives. So thank you for that. So we yield ourselves to you and we pray that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher this morning. We pray that you would help us to be doers of the word, not hearers only. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> We've been watching Jesus reveal himself as the good shepherd for quite, quite a while now. Many, 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 many weeks. Um, way back in chapter 9, we watched Jesus heal a man born blind. And, you know, it, he was gracious to do that. And he healed this man he'd never had seen before. He'd never seen color. He'd never seen sunset, sunrises. Um, and so he does this. And then the, the, the Pharisees have an, uh, an issue with this because he healed on the Sabbath. And according to their tradition, you couldn't do that. Not according to God's word. Jesus never violated God's word, but he violated their tradition, and it seems that he did so purposely, uh, went out of his way to get under their skin, so to speak. And, and so we saw that Jesus had compassion on this man. They interrogated this man. He, then they asked his parents, and his parents said, he's a man of age, let, you know, let uh, him speak for himself. And then, he, then this man uh, said, you know, basically, you can't un understand that. This, this, we've never seen anyone get healed from being blind from birth, and you're wondering if he is from God, and they cast him out. Then Jesus heard about it, as we saw, and found him, revealed himself as the Messiah. He believed in him, and then he went into this whole thing about being a good shepherd and his sheep and all of that. We learned so much about how God is such a faithful shepherd and all of that. Well, we're going to see here that now there's time that's gone by a little bit, but he's still talking about his sheep to these religious leaders. And so we get to enjoy seeing this and being a witness to all of that. And then, but he's saying so many comforting words to us about him being a faithful shepherd. And he's such a faithful shepherd. He thinks of everything. You know, it said, it was said of him, he does all things well. He still does all things well. And he's so good at caring for us. He's so good at watching over us and ministering to us and being that faithful shepherd. And we see over and over in the scriptures where he just is moved with compassion 
And that's literally talking about being moved from the deepest parts of your bowels, and, you know, of who you are and having this compassion and saying these people were wandering like a sheep without a shepherd. He wants to be a shepherd to the whole world. And so he wants to use us to be able to communicate that amazing gospel. And, um, and so here we begin in verse 22. He says, now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem and it was winter. So now we're at an t- entirely different feast, not a feast that Moses commanded uh, because it's the feast of dedication. So the Feast of Tabernacles is in the fall, as we saw. So that's in the late September, early October time. All this time we've been you know, talking about or seeing him reveal that he's a good shepherd and all the things he said was around just after that um, feast ended. And, and so now this is two and a half months has gone by. This is in the beginning, middle of, of uh, December now. It's winter, we're told in the, in the verse, at the end of verse 22. It's winter. And so now he's just a few months. It's December, so let me count on my fingers, January, February, March, April. Four months from the cross. So he's getting even closer to the cross. Half of John's gospel is basically the last week, uh, and, and most of it is the last night before his betrayal and, and all of that. So John was written 35 years later after the last gospel was written. So he's seen the synoptic gospels, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, be used by the Lord for decades. So as he's praying about writing this gospel, he's possibly thinking what was left out, what, what's important, what do they need to hear that they didn't, they didn't learn from the gospels. And so he gets to pray about all this, and he knows that the most important thing is that people place their faith in Jesus as the Messiah, so he writes this book about that, but he talks about the night of his betrayal. We're going to get into that in chapters 14 through 16 and everything, and then the betrayal that happens, and then all there's so much in John that's not in the other gospels, and it's beautiful. So he so you would never know from the other gospels that Jesus ever went to Jerusalem apart from the feast. But John's been mainly focusing on Jesus's Gal or Judean ministry in Jerusalem, not so much on you know in the Galilee, although he does touch on it. So this is, this is perfect for us to see that he's dealing with this, this situation again, this confrontation, as we'll see in a moment, again, a few months later after that last feast uh, ended, and now he's at this new feast. So the Feast of dedica- Dedication here, it's Hanukkah. Anyone celebrate Hanukkah here? Yeah, there's freedom to celebrate Hanukkah. Don't you give gifts on Hanukkah too? Because I, I would not be bothered at all to receive gifts during Hanukkah. I am not going to be um, discriminatory, if that's a word. I will receive gifts. So I don't know. I don't know if that's a thing. I'm pretty sure it is. But um, interesting time in their history that they're celebrating. So there's, there was this man, a Syrian um, general or a king named Antiochus IV, who ruled Palestine from 175 to 165 B.C., as a surrogate to the Greek Empire. He went crazy by the revolt and liberation of the temple led by Jewish rebel Judas Maccabeus. So that's something that they celebrated because he conquered the temple. He, con- he, had, he was conquering the whole area. But uh, here he is, um, you know, in this feast here that they're celebrating. It's also called the Feast of Lights. And, and it was, it was um, something that they, ce- they still celebrate today, obviously. Again, and we'll see that this December when I get some gifts. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Don't give me gifts. Uh, the gifts can be really difficult to process. Uh, um, that's a whole other story. People used to give me pop tarts, you know, because I talk about pop tarts and sermons, and like I love pop tarts. I can't have them now, but I'm telling you, I got a steady supply of pop tarts. So that's that's the backstory to me, like being easy, be, be easy with gifts, because um, then there's a stewardship of pop tarts, and I got to deal with all that and. Uh, I don't, it's not really, they're not really good for me, so it wouldn't be good. So hopefully that doesn't happen. But anyway, they're celebrating this feast, verse 23, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Now Solomon porch, Solomon's porch was on the east side of the temple complex. It was basically an open area, there were also no walls, but it had a roof over it. And so they could, they could come and, and, and be around the things of the Lord, no matter what the weather was. And it was very popular with the early believers uh, in terms of preaching the gospel and, and, and proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. And it was a very popular place there on, on, on Solomon's um, porch. Now, what's interesting is that the word walked there in verse 23 is in the imperfect tense. 
And the imperfect tense in Greek means continuous action in the past. So this is, Jesus is consistently walking. He's, he's constantly walking in this situation in the temple. He's walking all around. It's not just a short little walk. He's walking all over the place there. And, and it was, it, again, it was a very popular later for the apostles to, to teach there. So he's in the temple. He's walking around. And then notice in verse 24, then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt if you are the Christ? Tell us plainly. Now, this word surrounded is in the same tense. Consistently, continuously, the Jews were surrounding him. So they were constantly surrounding him. They were, it wasn't just this one little th- time where they just stand there. They're, it's like growing. It's growing. More and more unbelieving religious leaders, because that's what he's talking about with the Jews. It's always, in, not always, but most of the time in John's gospel, when he says the Jews, he's talking about unbelieving religious leaders. So they kept... They kept surrounding him. They kept, they kept growing and all that. And he said to them, how long, they said, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, this is not this investigation on their end to uh, find out the truth and, and want to receive Christ or anything like that. They're wanting to catch him in a trap. They're trying to trap him. And he knows that. You know, it says in Proverbs that God knows our thoughts from afar. He's at a slight, dis, a slight advantage over us. We're plotting against, they're plotting against Jesus. He knows their thoughts from afar. So uh, it, it's not going to really work. Uh, and, and so um, he has told them plainly because they're saying, how long do you keep, keep us in doubt? Tell us plainly. He's been saying it over and over and over again. And, and he says that in verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you and you did not believe. The works that I do in my father's name, they bear witness of me. Later, John's going to, re- to reveal, and we're going to see it in chapter 15, verse 4, this, if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would, have, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. So clearly, it says all through the Old Testament, it talks about in Isaiah and other places that the Messiah, uh, he would be doing miracles. He'd be healing and all of that. I mean, so God, what he did in the Old Testament, I love it because any honest person that's seeking and wanting to know who the Messiah is or if God even promised a Messiah, there's so many scriptures, dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of very specific scriptures to say, when I come, I'm going to paint this portrait, portrait in the Old Testament so that when I come, you can't miss me. And, and, and to, so that they're without excuse. And one of those prophecies had to do with doing miracles. So, you know, it's funny. People will go, well, you know, I don't believe, you know, the Old Testament has enough evidence and scriptures related to Jesus being the Messiah, but I'll believe no Tradamus. You know, I'll believe this, all these other crazy things that don't have nearly the amount of evidence behind it. They'll believe those things, but they'll deny the things that reveal plainly that Jesus is the Christ. There's a book called Search for Messiah. And uh, it was this doctor, I don't know if he was a medical doctor, but he was a, a doctor, and, and uh, he co-wrote a book with Pastor Chuck Smith. Uh, it's called Search for the Messiah. And it, what it's really neat, if you really want to learn about this, you can, what it does is it quotes all of the writings of the Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. It, it shows what the, what the rabbis were teaching about those scriptures before Jesus came. And clearly they were, they were absolutely, without a doubt, Messianic. They were, they were talking about the Messiah. But some for some strange, weird reason, after Jesus came, all of a sudden those scriptures weren't messianic. Interesting how that happens, huh? So you can read in this book, you can read what the rabbis said about these, these scriptures that are clearly messianic. And it's great to, to bring to somebody that you know, is Jewish and, and they're like, they have no idea what the rabbis have said about these scriptures that are clearly written about the Lord Jesus. I've told the story before, but I was in Israel and I went to this shop and we were, you know, they were, my other people that was with me, they were haggling. They like, they were like to haggle and get a good deal. And, and the Jews really loved that too. And, um, so we were talking to him and then we, we gave him, we had him read out of a, um, an old Testament in Hebrew, Isaiah 53. And, and he's reading it and he goes, oh, well, we don't believe in Jesus. And we're like, who said anything about Jesus? We didn't say anything about Jesus, but it's clear that Jesus, it's talking about Jesus or you wouldn't have brought it up. You know, that's like the forbidden passage, Isaiah 53, that's not on their yearly reading schedule, at least not historically. And it's almost like they don't want people to, to read that verse. I've seen videos of people in Israel talking to Jews and saying, can you read this for me? And they're saying, well, I don't believe in the New Testament. 
It's like it's not the New Testament. So it's clear that God has made it obvious that these scriptures are about Jesus, that things beyond his control, where he'd be born, you know, how many pieces of silver he would be betrayed by, and, you know, and, and all these scriptures that are outside, even na- he even names the exact Bethlehem because there were two Bethlehem at that time. There were one in the Galilee in the north where Jesus was from, and there's one in, in Judea that where, he, where, the, where we know Bethlehem is. And, 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 you know, Micah got that correct. The prophet Micah got that the right Bethlehem. He says, Bethlehem Ephrathah. That's the Bethlehem in the south, not the one in the north. So it's just so much precision. We're not even, even addressing how critically important the prophecies in Daniel are, or Daniel prophesies, and he, he gets it right in terms of the day that Jesus is going to be presented on Palm Sunday as the Messiah. All of those things were, were, were prophesied to the day, to the actual day. And, he, and you can study all that. I, I went into that, I think, around Good Friday um, or Palm Sunday, whatever it was. Um, it would make sense if it was Palm Sunday, but you never know with me. So, but... So anyway, that's, that's, that's what he's getting at. There's clearly scripture. He's, he's told them plainly, you know, and, and, and they just don't want to believe it. And that's what he says. He says, they bear witness of me. And then he says the reason why they're not one of the Lord, or why they're not believing, verse 26. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep, not of my sheep, as I said to you. So their actions demonstrate their identity. Because if they were one of his sheep, they wouldn't be trying to plot against him and kill him, you know, and everything. So he's saying, you're not one of my sheep. That's why you do not believe. And then he says in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. As I said, when we looked at him, he said this earlier, what I talked about was like, he knows us better than we know ourselves. So we, you know, he knows all of our failures and we sometimes don't want to go close to, to him because we're failing and we're falling short but we always want to fall towards him, not fall away from him. So it's not hypocrisy to come here when you're struggling because you're not pretending that you have everything together and you're perfect and everything. This is a hospital. This is an emergency room. This is, this is, I mean, it's clearly God is ministering to people here, and I love it. So we have to be, I understand that we have to not, you know, go against what he says about us, and we need to understand that he knows us, way more than we know ourselves. And he knows, he knows your failures that you're going to have tomorrow. He knows your failures next week, next month, five years from now. He paid for all of your sins on the cross. All the sins at the cross were future sins. And, he, and so he, he has provided grace and knows more about our failures than we could ever know and already has prepared or, or, or um, compensated for that by dying for those sin, sins on the cross. So there's no reason for us to draw back from God. He's called us to draw as close as we can. And that's what actually changes us when we're struggling is drawing close to him. And the enemy knows that if we don't draw near to him and we're struggling and we isolate and we're not around God's people, we're going to be worse off. So that's his plan is to get you away from the things of the Lord, the enemy's plan. And so we just have to know that and not allow our shortcomings and our failures to get in the way of drawing close to him. He says, come boldly into the throne of grace in our time of need and we will obtain grace and mercy. So he wants us to come boldly. We would ne- they, the Jewish mind would never comprehend that. They, would, they couldn't even come into the Holy of Holies. That was only the priest once a year, and that after his own sins were paid for, he could go in there once a year. There was no boldness about that. Uh, and he tells us to come boldly into the, in, in, you know, in that throne room and to be able to lift our needs before him. But he says, my, vo- my sheep know my voice. That still small voice that's inside of us we know that that's him we know that it's him that's 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 speaking to us and what a privilege it is that god would even speak to us and then on top of that would lead lead us and guide our lives it's such a privilege and notice he says and they follow me A, a, a characteristic of a true believer is that we would be following jesus so this whole thing of just you know having a mental agreement of the facts of the gospel and that's it. And there, there's been no repentance. There's been no receiving. There's just, there's just a mental agreement. God doesn't, know anything, God doesn't know anything about that being legitimate and sincere and, and um, in terms of what works regarding coming to know him. He wants us to follow him. It's not like an either or. Well, yeah, there's some Christians that don't follow. Like, no, the whole thing is to follow me. If you're a sheep, you're going to demonstrate that. You're going to follow um, the Lord.
And then Paul said that we hear that still small voice and God speaks us by his spirit. He said in Romans 8, 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So God, one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to testify to us that we're all, that we are his sheep or one of his sheep. And, and so of course, Corinthians says that we need to examine ourselves to see whether or not we're in the faith. And he says, if Christ lives in you, you pass the test. So that's, that's healthy for us to, to do that. But once we know we're a believer, the Holy Spirit will speak to us and, and reassure us that we're believers because we get tripped up by our sin, but there's a difference between a practical righteousness and a positional righteousness. We're in Christ. Our positional standing is that we're perfect before God. When God looks through that lens of, of the blood of Christ, he sees our lives. That's how, why he could have anything to do with us. That's different than our practical holiness, how we actually live. So that is always, of course, that's important, and we're always growing in that. But as we focus in our positional standing, that's what allows us to grow in holiness. It's not like we grow in, in practical holiness, and that allows us to be more in Christ. No, that's, that's legalism. That's going against the cross. The truth is we need to just uh, follow him and, and recognize that our positional standing is what it is. And, and he, know, he sees our lives through the blood of Christ and that allows us to draw closer, and that allows us to grow in our personal walk with him, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. There needs to be works, though. Not to be saved, not to stay saved, but it will naturally follow if we're saved. James said, well, faith without works is dead. He says, I'll demonstrate my faith by my works. So we're not saved by works. We're saved unto good works. That's what comes out of my life because our lives are a response to what Jesus did for us. John, when I quoted this a week or two ago, John said that we love him because he first loved us. So our whole, the whole Christian life is a response. You know, man-made religion is man's attempt to reach God through works. Christianity is God's attempt to reach man through the cross and offer salvation as a gift. Completely, entirely different than any other thing that's out there. Because it's honest with who we are that we're sinners instead of saying that we're basically good and just need to improve. And also it puts the focus and the glory on God and what he did. No one else came and died for our sins. No one even talks about sin as an issue. It's more of a mindset or, a, or an attitude or all of that. So he saved us for good works. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 we're told, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he created us for good works. He hasn't called us to just receive blessings, hoard blessings. Jesus said, freely you receive, now freely give. So that the whole reason why he's poured into us what he's poured into us and what he will continue to pour into us is that we can be vessels, that we can be an extension of him in this world and, 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 and glorify God. People will glorify God when they see our good works. He wants that to happen. We're so self-focused and thinking this is all about making us blessed and all about a prosperous life and all of that. And we are prosperous by God's definition of prosperous. But he's mainly poured into us and, and, and wants to um, use everything that he's poured into us so that we can be a vessel through whom we, uh, he can bless people. And that's a, a huge privilege. So then Jesus in verse 28 says, and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Notice in the beginning of verse 28, he says, and I give them eternal life. Again, salvation is a gift. We can't earn it. If you're visiting here, you don't understand the gospel, and you think that somehow if you're good enough and you do enough righteous deeds or religious deeds, that somehow that will outweigh your sin but it can't. We cannot do anything to undo the crimes that we've done and sinned against God. Only Jesus has come and paid that price and took the punishment that we deserve. And then he, he gets our sin, he got our sin, and he, we get his righteousness put to our account. And it's all by, for there for the asking. It's nothing that we earn. We can't earn it. We could never uh, be good enough to undo that. So salvation is a gift. And what he's doing in these two verses, I believe, remember, he's talking to Pharisees. He's talking to religious leaders. He's giving them characteristics. He said, you're not one of, part of my sheep. You're not one of my sheep. Um, and, and then he's saying, you know, these are the characteristics of my sheep. They know, they know my voice. They know me. I know them. And, and, you know, they follow me. But there's another characteristic about them is that they're protected. 
They're protected by me and they're protected by the Father. And nothing's going to get in the way of that. Any threat from without, the, the, you know, the, the Pharisees, the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, you know, our sin directly, you know, our sin's been paid for, so that's not going to cause us to, you know, nothing, no one out from without can snatch us out of Jesus' hand and, and the Father's hand. Um, and, and so that's supposed to bring us a lot of comfort. Now, why is he telling these Pharisees this? Because this is, again, not, I mean, we get to hear it, of course, because John recorded it, but he's telling it to Pharisees. He's trying to tell them he is such a, he is so legitimate in terms of the Messiah and, and the great, the good shepherd and the great shepherd of the sheep and the chief shepherd that all the, all these different descriptions of the shepherd. He is so legitimate in terms of the promised Messiah that he has the power to keep us who are his sheep. He has the power to do that. And it's such a beautiful thing. It's such something that he wanted to communicate to these religious leaders to make sure they know not only am I secure, but that my followers are secure. I'm going to protect them like any good shepherd would. No, good shepherds don't lose sheep. They go after the lost sheep. They, they protect the, his, their sheep, all of that. And he's saying that's the case as well. I do not believe this is referring to getting on the subject of apostasy. There's other scriptures that deal with that and all of that. So that's, not what, that's a whole other sermon. That's a whole other thing. He's talking about threats from without. Uh, and, and so... That's important for us to know, I believe, in terms of understanding the context and all of this. So um, what a great thing to be able to have that confidence that the enemy or, or my, my direct sin or, or fair religious leaders or anyone that, that's in my life that is a religious authority, they cannot get in the way of my relationship with um, the Jesus and, and, and the Father. Because the Father it says he's greater than all and no one can snatch him out of my Father's hand. So there's no, we have total, complete security. And that security is important for us to understand and believe because that guards us, that protects us. Uh, and we want to be protected because there's, you know, we, there's doubts that we have at times. And he's saying, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And it's beautiful to see his protective care over our lives. And notice he added in verse 30, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones to stone him. Now remember, the the... The, I don't know if you want to call it a privilege or a right or whatever, but they weren't allowed to engage in capital punishment unless someone crossed over from the court of the Gentiles into the court of the women. Um, they were not allowed to, to execute people. Now, they ignored that with Stephen, and they want to ignore this. They, they were so pushed over the edge by what Jesus says, they wanted to completely risk so much related to the Romans to be able to you know, stone him and, 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 and kill him. But that, that wasn't going to happen. And then he says in verse 32, Jesus answered them, many good works I have shown you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, for a good work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. So if there's any doubt <laughs> that Jesus was what he was claiming, it's removed with verse 33. Because it says clearly here that he, he was making himself to be God. He was claiming deity. And Jesus answered them, is it not in your law? I said, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the father sanctified and set, sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the son of God. So the, the Jehovah's Witnesses love this verse. I don't know if you care about what they love, but they love this verse because they're, when we're trying to establish that Jesus is God, he's saying, no, Look at Jesus even said from Psalm 82, verse 6, and he's saying that God, it, already people have been called gods. So what's wrong with, you know, so men were called gods. So that, it doesn't, this doesn't mean that he's claiming anything special. Nothing could be further from the truth. He's, what he's saying is humans have been called gods. So if humans have been called gods, and it was a negative sense in Psalm 82, the judges were, you know, were, he was pronouncing calamity upon them. Um, and they were, they were, um, you know, they were not being just. And so he calls them that they have that authority and he pronounces calamity upon them. So it was a negative thing. But the, he's, what he's saying is, if, he, if, if God has called, referred to people in a negative sense, God's, what, why is it any big deal that, that someone who has been sanctified, in verse 36, and sent into the world, why in the world would you have a problem with me saying I am the son of God? And so the obvious answer is there, you shouldn't. And Jesus was, the son was referred to as the mighty God in Isaiah 9, 6. So any talk from Jews, even today, that say, 
you know, the, there's nothing in the Old Testament that said that the son would be called God. Well, there you have it in, in, in Isaiah 9, 6. And then in Psalm 2, you know, it's clear, and I read that a few weeks ago, that, that the, the son is, 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 you know, someone other than a human based on what he's describing there. And when, when at the Battle of Armageddon, when at the end, when, they all, when he's about to come back, all the armies that are attacking the Antichrist at that time, they're all going to unite and look to him who's coming and unite against him, which is insane to think that you could fight God and win. You know, so that whole, and he said he's going to laugh and he's going to cause them to be in derision and, 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 he's, and you know, they're going to be defeated. And the Antichrist is going to be defeated. So it's crazy that he would say that. But he's saying it's not unreasonable that I'm claiming to be the son of God when in a negative sense, God is referred to people as God's and it's, uh, it, you know, it's clear what he's saying. And then he says in verse 37, if I do not do the works of my father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that, that the father is in me and I in him. He's saying the work speaks for themselves. What I've been doing speaks for themselves. If you don't want to believe my words, don't believe my words, but believe the works because those are, those are it's clear that only God can do those things and do those miracles. And so he's just saying, you, you know, you don't believe, but you should. And he's still trying to reach these. We've seen it over and over again. He's still trying to reach these religious leaders. And some of them do believe. We're told when that many priests believed uh, later on in the scripture. So they, he did reach them. He was trying to reach them. Verse 39. Therefore, they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. It's interesting that they're fighting so hard to just go against God's plan. And there's a specific timing of Jesus going to the cross. And nothing was going to get in the way of that. That prophecy of Daniel, that he's going to ride in on that donkey on Palm Sunday, it's going to be fulfilled to the day. No man's going to get in the way of that. No man, we've seen it all, over and over again where he says, my hour has not yet come. And he goes right in their midst and they can't, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if they're trying to grab him and they just, they can't touch him or, you know, they just, I don't know how he did that, but he walks right through their midst. You know, the chosen has them like frozen. You ever do that as a kid? You're like, pray, play, like you're freeze, you know, like, you know, and, and I don't know if they just couldn't move or it's going to be interesting to see. I hope he has, you know, available to us like some kind of video of being able to watch everything. Wouldn't it be cool to be in heaven and you have all the time in the world? It's not like you're going anywhere, you know, and you just completely watch all of the whole gospels and all the other things that the gospel don't, doesn't record, which is a lot to be able to watch all of that and then be able to go to those people and, and ask them questions, that would be great. Talk, talk about, just imagine the, those people, the apostles and Paul and all that, how, how long that would take for them to talk to everyone and answer everybody's questions. It would be really difficult. Verse 40, And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. Then many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John wrote about this man were true. And verse 42 says, and we end the chapter with this, and many believed in him there. So again, more people coming to faith in Christ, more people trusting in him. And he wanted to get away. He went to beyond on the other side of the Jordan, east of the, of the Jordan there. And, and uh, they, they, they said, well, John didn't perform a sign, but the things that John spoke about this man were true. Because John spoke and testified. He was the forerunner and spoke of Jesus Christ and all those things were true. They came to that conclusion and they believed in him there. So that, so this is just expanding and, and it, everything's ramping up. The persecution's ramping up, but also people believing is ramping up. So what a blessing this passage has been. You know, the security of the believer is, is, is such a blessing to think about. We have all the protection we could ever dream of to be protected from threats from with, without. We don't have to fear the enemy plucking us out of God's hand. Um, Jesus said he would never leave us nor forsake it, sake us. Our sins have been paid for, even the ones we haven't even committed yet. So it's beautiful to think about God's grace related to that. All of our sins were future sins on the cross. And, and he wants us to not to be insecure about our salvation. It's based on what Jesus did. How we, he paid the price. There's nothing that we, do, we can do to add to salvation. Jesus plus nothing. You know, uh, you know by, say by grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone. And, and, and that's the key. So we're, we're secure and all of that. And he wants us to be confident. That, remember, there's a helmet of salvation because our, the battle is in the mind. 
you know, and we, self, we condemn ourselves. We go against Romans 8.1, that there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But we condemn ourselves. We have no right to condemn ourselves. If God doesn't condemn us, who are we to, to condemn ourselves? Because everything's been taken care of. Everything's been paid for. He's, a, he's, he's done everything. There's, he has not left anything out. So we need to walk with that armor, you know, the helmet of salvation, being totally, completely secure in our salvation, knowing that he's paid the price for everything and that we don't have to worry about those things because he, he tosses them to this, into the sea, never to be remembered again. He, he's not going to say, oh, you know what? I was just thinking I was, you know, I, I'm changed my mind. I want you to actually have to suffer as it relates to, to this sin. And it will never, ever do that. What a faithful shepherd we have. He's thought of everything. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for how you protect us from threats from without. Thank you, Lord, that we're so, um, we have so many precious promises from you that you say in your word are yes and amen. So we just thank you for all that. Use these verses in, in our lives by your, by your grace. In Jesus' name.